welcome to this second talk. Now we're going to take a, another look at graph drawing and the theme of graph drawing, but it's going to be from a completely different point of view. Instead of taking graphs and trying to represent them geometrically, we're going to take a look at graph drawing from the point of view of fixed parameter tractability. Now, what's fixed parameter tractability? Well, I, kn I know that you had an a, a invited speaker here in August at the Research Institute, uh, Mike Fellows, who's one of the two founders of uh, fixed parameter tractability and has made it a huge area of research within uh, design of algorithms and, and complexity analysis. And Mike came and gave a talk, at least one talk, on fixed parameter tractability. Told me he had a fantastic time. He came to Victoria in, in the fall. He, he used to teach there, actually. So I got to see him, and he told me he had a fantastic time in, in, uh, in Iran. So I know some of this will be familiar to you already from that talk of his. And also, maybe you've had an FPT uh, warm-up in your own uh, pre-conference uh, workshops. So yes, no, I don't remember who. Yes, somebody talked about FPT. OK, so I'll just uh, 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 briefly introduce what's the idea of FPT and give an example of uh, uh, a typical, the most famous example of fixed parameter tractable algorithm. And then in the second part, we'll see how, what that looks like when you try to apply the same ideas to um, problem and graph drawing. So here we go. We've just looked at how to represent graphs geometrically. Uh, and now, from the point of view of graph drawing, what we want to get at is uh, how to take a fixed parameter tractable or approach, or at least see one example of doing that. Because I think looking at graph drawing problems uh, from a fixed parameter tractable analysis point of view is an interesting thing to do because whenever you try to optimize something about a layout, you're very likely to get uh, an NP complete problem. Try to find a minimum area drawing or try to maximize or minimize some property of a drawing. You very often get a hard problem. So if you can find a way to to define a parameter, then you have a chance at taking an FPT approach. So we're going to have this brief introduction to fixed parameter tractability. So please forgive me if you've heard this twice in, uh, since August. Uh, and uh, then uh, we'll take a look at an example of an FPT algorithm and graph drawing. Introduction, and, and we're going to have a little change of slide set there when we go to part two. So introduction to fixed parameter tractability. So the most famous problem in fixed parameter tractability that people talk about as an example is the vertex cover problem. So you have an undirected graph, and what you're looking for is a subset of the vertices that's a vertex cover. So that means that you want a collection of vertices that together touch all the edges. So each edge has got to have one or the other endpoint in this vertex cover. It has to be touched. Maybe it has both endpoints. That's fine. So an edge that has at least one of its endpoints in the, the set V uh, prime, we're going to say it's, it's covered. Likewise, you're familiar with the definition of an independent set on the graph. We just want a collection of vertices that don't have any any pair of edges uh, uh, having a, any pair of vertices having an edge between them. If the vertices aren't adjacent, we say they're independent. And uh, we notice the, this relationship between vertex cover and independent set. If I have a vertex cover, namely these black vertices, you'll notice each edge in this graph has got at least one endpoint that's black. Some edges have both endpoints black. Some edges have just one black endpoint, but every edge is touched. And you'll notice if you take the complement of the black vertices, all the vertices that aren't in the cover, then they form an independent set. And, and why is that? Well, if you have two vertices that aren't in the cover, if they were adjacent by an edge, well, then that edge wouldn't be covered. So, so therefore, 
uh, the vertices that are the complement of a vertex cover form an independent set. So if we look for a minimum vertex cover, a vertex cover of minimum size, we're si simultaneously finding an independent set of maximum, uh, maximum size. So that nice relationship between those two problems. So the, the decision problem version of vertex cover says you have a graph, you have some positive integer k, and you want to answer yes or no, does that graph have a vertex cover of size in most k? That's the familiar problem that we know as in NP complete. We could ask an optimization version of it. We could say, given a graph, please find the size of the smallest vertex cover. Maybe we actually want the vertex cover. That's, that would be trying to find uh, the optimum solution, not just asking yes or no, can you, can you get it under some number k? So how do we solve vertex cover uh, if we're given g and k is the input? So one technique is to use uh, what's called a bounded, uh, bounded uh, search tree technique, which is one of the main techniques for designing fixed parameter tractable algorithms. And um, it's a, a kind of a back tr backtracking approach. So we have a graph. We have a, a vertex cover V prime. And, and what we notice is that for each vertex in the graph, if the vertex is not in the vertex cover, then all its neighbors have got to be in the vertex cover because we've got to cover the star, this, this star here. So here's a, here's a vertex x, and here's all its neighbors. Some of them may be adjacent to one another. We may have adjacencies amongst this. But if, if I don't select this vertex to be in the vertex cover, then in order to touch all these edges, I have to choose all the neighbors. So either I pick that set or I pick that set. For every vertex, I have to do that. So, so what, what can, how can we use that, uh, that, uh, simple idea. Well, we're just going to make a branching tree structure. Pick, pick a vertex, any vertex in your graph, and now you have two choices to make. So you can start imagining you have a, a tree-like structure. Either you're going to put the vertex in the cover, which means that you have to reduce your remaining budget, k, by 1, so now your budget goes down to k minus 1, or you're not going to put and, and, and so you're going you're gonna to ask this, what about this graph G prime when I throw away X and all its uh, uh, adjacent edges and reduce the budget? I have to ask, with this smaller budget, can I find a vertex cover in G prime uh, with the budget of K prime? But the alternative is I don't take the vertex. I decide to take its neighbors. Neighbors don't include the vertex, just, just the adjacent vertices. And then that means in G double prime, what I need to do is look for a vertex cover that has size at most K double prime, which is K minus the number of neighbors that I decided to put in the vertex cover so far. So I just keep recursively uh, uh, trying to solve this problem as long as I have some remaining budget that's uh, left, as long as the k prime is equal to or greater than zero, and as long as the k double prime is equal to or greater than zero. And uh, if uh, the answer is no, well, then I'm done at some stage. And otherwise, uh, I, I still get, I, I return the, what the cover is, and otherwise I, I, say, I say no. So basically, the idea is I just am saying, I start off with some vertex x, and I branch where I uh, 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 choose x, and here I don't choose x to, to go in, in the vertex cover. And then that gives me a situation where now I have a smaller tree. So I have g, I have a smaller graph, sorry. G without the X, 
And here I have G, I have to take away the neighborhood of X, and I have a budget of K minus 1, and here I have a budget of K minus the size of the neighbors. And I keep, I keep branching like that and getting smaller and smaller graphs. Notice that in each situation, as I process a node, the budget is going to go down by at least one. So that means that the depth of this tree can be at most k. If I haven't found a vertex cover by the, by the time I've gotten down k levels, then the answer is no, it's not possible to do it. So I, I, I'm obliged to choose x or its neighbors. Here, in this graph, I choose any vertex whatsoever, and I branch. Either I take that vertex or I don't ver take that vertex. So I can have at most k levels in this graph. I can't keep on branching down here if I don't have a vertex cover yet, because it would mean I'm taking, taking, too, many, taking too many vertices into my, my, my vertex cover. I don't have the budget for it. So that's a simple way to solve that problem with this technique of bounded search trees. And the, the running time is going to be something like 2 to the k, because we have to look at the most 2 to the k nodes in that branching tree. And n, n is the size of the graph, not the number of vertices in it, the whole size of the graph. So number of vertices plus all the information about the edges, that's what the n represents. So at each node in the tree, I can spend linear time in the size of the graph throwing away a vertex and uh, reducing the budget, or throwing away its neighbors and reducing the budget. So I'm going to get a running time that looks like order 2, 2 kn. So that's an example of something that's fixed parameter tractable. So what's that mean? So let's define what's a parameterized decision problem and what's a fixed, fixed parameter tractable algorithm. So if I have an undirected graph and some positive integer k, then I can think of that k as, an, as a parameter. It's just not, not all graph problems are going to come with some parameter. Uh, we can choose anything we like for the parameter, but often graph problems come with some positive integer. Like ruler folding, we had uh, uh, m, the size of the longest link. We have some kind of parameter associated with the problem. And then we, we ask, uh, is there a vertex cover with size at most, that, that budget in this case? So that's an example of a parameterized uh, decision problem. So we have this parameter. And now what we're going to do is aim for an algorithm right from the beginning. We're going to try to design an algorithm that solves this problem and that has running time that is expressed in terms of the input size n. Remember, n is the size of the whole graph, not just the number of vertices, and this parameter k. And that running time, we want to have a very special form. We say that our algorithm is fixed parameter tractable if the running time turns out to look like some horrible function of the k, or maybe a nice function of the k, but if it's an NP-complete problem, we're not likely to find a polynomial function of the k, we, we can have a, any arbitrary function here uh, of k. So it can be k to the k to the k factorial, any terrible thing you like, and then multiplied by the size of the graph raised to some, some constant, like 1, for example. 1's very nice. n squared, some terrible function of k times, say, n squared. So that's an example of a fixed parameter tractable running time. So essentially what we're doing is putting the responsibility for this, uh, what looks like having to do brute, uh, brute force, uh, uh, exhaustive enumeration, having the uh, exponential running time. We're putting the blame on the size of the k. And we're saying, well, really, it looks linear or quadratic in the size of the graph, graph, and the problem is really coming from the parameter. That's what's causing us the, the exponential running time. So why is this an interesting attitude for an algorithm designer to adopt? Well, 
if we can find an algorithm like this by aiming for the running time at the beginning and using these well-developed techniques that the community has come up with at this point, then there's a chance you can solve the problem for low values of k and get some, some kind of useful, useful algorithm. So we saw that with the ruler folding problem, right? We said, let's parameterize on the size of the maximum link length and say, now what's the running time? This, the, the longest link in the ruler folding problem, it could be two to the number of links. If you have n links, the longest, there's no relationship whatsoever between the longest link and the number of links you have. The longest link could be two to the two to the two to the two to the number of links you have. Could be a terrible. So if you parameterize on the size of the longest link, then we discover you got a linear time algorithm. So, so it's uh, uh, an interesting, uh, interesting uh, attitude to, to, to take. So examples of fixed parameter tractable running time, your function fk might be 2 to the k, it might be k to the k, it might be k to the 128k, that's OK. But the, name of the game, the objective is to separate the dependence on the parameter k from the dependence on the input size of the, of the, of the graph of the problem. So you notice there's, in this constant here, there's no c, the k is not showing up in that constant. It's something like 2 or 1 or whatever. k, the dependence on the, on the size of the graph doesn't mention k at all. The, Dependence on k is separated from the dependence on n. So if you have, happen to get a running time like this, a function of k plus, instead of times, uh, this uh, linear quadratic function, say, that's perfectly OK, because you can upper bound both those terms with fk times n to the c, and you still get what we're calling a fixed parameter, tractable running time. So, so uh, there's this whole notion that there's, lo there's a parallel structure in problems that admit fixed parameter tractable solutions. There's hardness results. There's a whole hierarchy of, of uh, uh, problems, of uh, types of problems that mirrors uh, uh, NP complete, P space complete, and so forth. There's towers of, of difficulty and uh, fixed parameter tractability, too. Uh, I'd just like to take, take the de basic definitions and go back and see uh, what happens with uh, uh, vertex cover when we, uh, uh, when we take, take this viewpoint. All right, so what we're going to do is, is apply some rules, kind of pre-processing rules to our vertex cover problem. We're going to notice that if we have, for example, a vertex that's not adjacent to anything, we might as well throw it out of our graph because it doesn't have, it's not going to be useful in the vertex cover. It doesn't cover anything. So just throw it out of the graph. It has no impact on uh, the budget for the graph. So just we call this rule clean up singletons. So as long as there's a vertex in the graph with degree zero, just replace the graph we're going to look at by g minus the, that vertex. And now, let's see, we're going to have another rule, and it goes like this. If we have a vertex that has a, a degree greater than k, then we better put it in the vertex cover. Because if we, if this is, if, if we have more than k neighbors here, if we don't put the vertex in, then we have to put all the neighbors in, but there's more than k of them. So if we're looking for a vertex cover of size k, we have to take this vertex. So rule two is going to say, put the high degree vertices in your vertex cover. You have no choice. If you, any hope of finding a vertex cover of size at most k, you gotta, you have to choose those high degree vertices. So as long as there's a vertex with high degree greater than k, put that in your vertex cover. Reduce your budget accordingly, and. Uh, concentrate on the remaining graph without that vertex, and the remaining budget is k minus 1. So keep doing that as long as you can. 
So the interesting thing to notice here is if you get to a stage where you can't apply rule two anymore, that means in your remaining graph that you're looking at, every vertex has degree at most k. So if every vertex has degree in most k, and you're looking for a vertex cover of size at most k, then you've got potentially k vertices in that cover, and each one of them has at most k neighbors, then you're going to have k squared of those neighbors plus the k vertices you put in your, in your vertex cover. You're going to have at most k squared plus k vertices in your remaining graph. So this is called a problem kernel. You've done some pre-processing to kind of boil the problem down, stew the problem down to a small graph that you have to process. The graph is so small, then it's just, it has so few vertices, and you've expressed the number in terms of k, then you can solve the rest of the problem, hopefully, uh, in time proportional to the k, and ignore the original input size. That's the plan. So here's another uh, observation that makes another clean cleanup rule, and this is just kind of a, a, nice, uh, a nice thing to do. If you have a, a vertex that's a pendant vertex, so it just has degree one, then it doesn't uh, hurt you to put the neighbor of the vertex in. You have to cover the edge that joins the pendant vertex to the rest of the graph. The pendant vertex only covers that one edge, and if you're lucky, the opposite endpoint will cover some more things. So it certainly doesn't hurt to put the opposite end in there. So as long as you have a vertex of degree one, then put the neighbor of that vertex in the vertex cover, reduce your budget by one, and look at the reduced graph that consists of throwing away the vertex and, and its neighbor. You don't have to uh, uh, cover those anymore. So here's a, another observation. If you have, instead of a pendant vertex, uh, a kind of a pendant triangle, that is to say, uh, if you have a vertex that's joined to the rest of the, a vertex of degree two, that's joined to the rest of the graph just by those two vertices, and if they happen to be adjacent to one another, so your, your, picture, your picture looks like this, here's the rest of the graph, and you have some vertex here, and it's got degree two, and the vertices it's adjacent to have an edge between them. Well, you're going to have to cover the three edges of that triangle, and so you might as well pick these two. If I pick this one and this one, I have to pick two anyway, so I might as well pick these two, because they might be, they might be able to cover lots, lots more vertices. It doesn't hurt to pick those two uh, vertices from this triangle. I have to pick two out of the three vertices in any case. So pick those two. That does the job and maybe helps, helps out. So that's another rule. Now no, notice when you apply any of these, these rules, you're reducing the budget. You're always deciding to put at least one vertex, one more vertex in the vertex cover, either because you have to or because it doesn't hurt to do that. So your budget's going down. So you can keep applying these rules as long as you have any, any, any uh, budget left to do that, which means we can look for a situation where we can apply a rule and then apply that rule, so update the graph and the budget. We can do that at most k times, or, and then we're out of budget. So in most k times, we can apply one of these rules. So we just keep doing that until we run out of the budget, or until we can't apply the rules anymore, we still have some budget left. So if we, if we have some budget left and we've applied all those rules, then that means we have no more high degree vertices. So the number of vertices is at most k squared plus k. Uh, so if what we get is bigger than that, then we just say, no, you cannot find a vertex cover of size at most k. What you, what you do is, Take the things you have to take, and what's left is, is, is too big. So, so you can answer no. Otherwise, you have to keep going. So maybe you have uh, 
uh, a kernel graph of size at most k squared plus k. So there's some hope. So what you can do at this stage is go back and use the bounded search tree approach. And that reduced graph, look for this situation. And the depth of the tree is, depends on what your remaining budget is. But uh, it's certainly not going to be any deeper than k. And the processing time for the nodes now, instead of being linear in the size of the whole original graph, it's linear in, in the size of the kernel graph, which is only k squared plus k. So the processing that's going on at these nodes has been drastically reduced by pre-processing the graph down to some, some so-called kernel graph. So you get a, a running time of a kn plus 2 to the k times k squared, which you might, you can, might as well multiply these two things together and say, OK, that's a running time of 2k k squared. So that's the function of k. That's the terrible function of k in this algorithm. And then times n, which is uh, the size of the original problem. So it's, the running time is linear in the size of the original problem. And that's the bad exponential function of, of k. So if I were looking for vertex cover of size n and a graph with, sorry, no, size of vertices, you know, it could, this could be an exponential algorithm in the original uh, description of the graph. But in terms of k, for small values of k, I have a chance of, of uh, getting, uh, I, I, could, I could say, I'm not interested in a vertex cover of size 20,000. I'm just going to find some other way to deal with my problem if it comes down to having to have a vertex cover of size 20,000. I only care about vertex covers of size 20. And uh, if you can find one of those, that's great. I'll go with that. And otherwise, I've just got to do something else. It's, it's, it's too much. So if you're willing to accept an attitude like that, then having an algorithm with this kind of running time can be uh, potentially uh, useful and interesting. OK, so that's the end of the first part, the little introduction to what's the idea of fixed parameter tractability in this famous uh, vertex cover example that everybody uh, uses as an introductory example for fixed parameter tractability. And any questions at this point about that? OK, so what we're going to see next is a problem in graph drawing. Graph drawing, remember graph drawing, we've just, this, we were looking at just combinatorial graph problem. Now we're going to look at a graph drawing problem, and we're going to talk about a simple fixed parameter tractable uh, algorithm for that. So I need to switch my slide sets here, so bear with me while I do this. That's what coming next means. I'm switching to the other slides. And these slides were prepared by a student who likes to use dark background color. So you can, thanks to him for these, these slides. So these are slides from, part, part of the slide set for a, a talk we gave at a graph drawing conference. So the student was Matthew Suderman. He's the person who made these nice, nice slides. And he also did some experiments. I'm not going to describe the experiments uh, in much detail, but I'll show you what path he, he took. So we were looking at, at layered drawings of graphs. This, this is a, a standard approach that goes back to the prehistory of graph drawing. You have a graph and you want to draw it on a bunch of layers. You may be, you may be, uh, can I erase the polygon here? <laughs> you may be uh, uh, given the layers or how, how to layer the vertices or not. But the idea is you're going you're gonna to draw your, your graph on a bunch of layers. So we'll just draw some horizontal lines here. And I'm going to put a bunch of vertices here, and a bunch of vertices here, and so forth. And uh, the rule is, I'm not going to put any edges between vertices in the same layer. Each, 
each edge has got to be between adjacent layers. And you'll notice that whether edges cross between two layers depends on how I order the vertices. So for example, if I have the ordering like this, A, B, C, D, then these two edges don't cross. But if I had decided to put B on this layer before C, then I would get a crossing. So what I'd like to do, and, and people do all kinds of strange and wonderful things, like suppose you want to connect A to that vertex. Well, then they introduce some dummy vertices, and maybe they know the assignment to the layers already, or maybe they have to determine that. Uh, but anyway, the idea is to have some, some layers in your drawing. And then you want to find a good permutation of the vertices to put on the first layer, a good permutation of the vertices on the second layer, so that the two permutations don't cause much crossing between the layers. And then the famous, the su famous Sugiyama Toda approach. These are two people. Uh, they, they said, they, they tried every algorithmic technique they could think of. They said to find good permutations. And, and basically, their strategy was something like, take a look at the first two layers, find good permutations of these two sets so you don't have many crossings, and then fix the permutation you just found for the second layer and ask for a permutation for the third layer that goes with the second layer and doesn't give you much crossing and go all the way down to the bottom like that. But then why not just go all the way back up to the top? Start with the permutation you found for the bottom layer and now ask for a good one for the next bottom layer that doesn't cause much. So adjust the permutation here to go with what you found at the bottom. So what they do is just kind of comb up and down this collection of layers until they're not getting any improvements in crossings and that's the Sugiyama Toda approach to layered graph drawing. So for that reason, it's very interesting to say just for two layers, how do you, uh, how do you find a good, good permutations of those, those, uh, those vertices? So there are a couple of things you might look at to say what you mean by good. One idea of good is you don't have very many crossings. Uh, but another idea of good, which is attractive from a visual uh, perception uh, point of view, is you, you want to minimize the number of edges that take the blame for creating the crossings. So instead of counting crossings, ask how many edges you have to remove in order to be left with a planar graph between those two vertices. Planar bipartite graph, that's what we'd like to have. We'd like to get that by removing edges and instead of counting, counting crosses. So Petra Mutzel, who's a real expert on graph drawing and has a, designed a lot of implementation software and contributed many students and postdocs to this area, she took a look at uh, this approach as well, minimizing, trying to minimize uh, the number of edges that you have to remove to leave a planar drawing. And she um, designed some integer linear programming approach and implemented it and did a lot of experiments with it. So we were doing something that wasn't integer linear programming. We were taking a fixed uh, parameter tractable approach. So by the way, this two-dimensional picture, we're drawing edges with uh, straight lines here. Uh, and we're putting endpoints on opposite sides, no edges within a layer, as I mentioned before. OK, so here's a picture of uh, this graph with its crossings removed by removing these four, four edges. There's four edges, one, two, three, and uh, four. I'm not sure where the four, well, anyway, you get the idea. Remove a small number of edges so that you've destroyed all the all the, uh, yeah, you can see them, see them there. With uh, this guy, and these ones, and this one. Those four edges are responsible for all the, all the clutter 
coming from edge crossings in that picture. So given a graph and an integer k, the question to look at is, is there a subset of edges such that that subgraph is, is biplanar? You can draw it on two uh, 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 levels without any edges, edges crossing. So here's an example. There are the blue edges that we had to remove. So the answer for that example graph is yes, as long as your budget is at least four. And uh, you can show that if your budget, you can rearrange these vertices in the two layers any way you like. Uh, but they're f the vertices are fixed within. You can't take a vertex here and put it down here, swap it around. Let's say the vertices are in these layers. And now if you have a budget of less than four, if you stare at that example long enough, you can convince yourself you're not going to be able to get rid of all the crossings. Uh, in fact, the two-layer planarization problem, so planarization means try to find a minimum number of edges you can take away to leave a planar graph. That problem is NP-complete. So let's try a uh, fixed-parameter tractable approach. Petra was using integer linear programming formulation. Uh, she found that worked pretty well compared to classical heuristics that were in use. But we wanted to try a fixed parameter tractable approach. So we have a result that says you can uh, solve this problem in time k times 6 to the k plus the size of the graph, the vertices and edges in the, in the graph. So that's a fixed parameter tractable uh, result. So this is just, what's the definition? We've seen this before. Fixed parameter tractable means running time is terrible function of k times n to some constant. And we already observed it's good enough to have something like this, because you can just multiply, upper bound these terms by multiplying them together and think of it that way. They're actually equivalent formulations. OK, so what are we going to do here? Oh, so yes, so non-example. Okay, so these slides have a non-example in it. This is a fixed parameter running time. Uh, this is a non-example g. The size of g to the k, well, we want a small k, but that doesn't count as a fixed parameter tractable running time. We've got to separate the size of the input from the dependence on k. So this would not be an example of fixed parameter tractable. Uh, that's a non-example. doesn't have the right form. But this, the running time of this algorithm, it, it is an example. Multiply these two things together, and you have a terrible function of k times a linear function of the input size. OK, so a little background for this simple FPT approach for two-layer layer planarization I'm going to show you. Here's a caterpillar. So that's a path with some leaves attached to it. So you can have as many leaves here as you like. And the picture is just showing two leaves. You don't have to have any leaves at all. You just have a path with some leaves attached. And here's a wreath. It's a cycle that has uh, some leaves attached to the vertices on the cycle. And a two claw is a vertex that's got three adjacent uh, neighbors. And they, they each are adjacent to to something else. So the neighbors are non leaves has three, uh, well, it's a, a, a picture like that. Three, three leaves attached to three, three neighbors. That's a two claw. So here's some conditions for, for uh, a graph to be uh, biplanar, drawable on two layers without any um, uh, crossings. It has to be a forest of caterpillars. You can have several connected components. You just lay the connected components, space them out along your two layers. So it's a, you, you, you need to have your graph look like a forest of caterpillars. That's what it looks like. So we're asking, given your graph, how do you arrange the permutations of the vertices and the layers so that you take out at most k edges, and what's left looks like a forest of caterpillars. So the path is going to zigzag and back and forth between the two layers. And in the Vs, what you get in the path, let's say here's a 
two layers, and we have a path like this. And in, in between the Vs, we're going to be able to put in the legs of the caterpillar. So we, we're going to get a picture like that. So that's, that's what we're aiming for. Remove edges until we have a path with some leaves attached to the vertices on the path. So the equivalent expression is your graph is acyclic and it doesn't contain a two claw. You can see the problem we would get in if we had a, a two claw. Then you can have a two claw. How would you draw a two claw? Here's a vertex. Here's an adjacent vertex. And let's put the leaf there. And we can do that on the other side as well. And now, where do we put the third vertex? We can't put it there. We can't put it there. We have to put it here. But now there's no room to draw the, to draw in the, the, uh, the leaf for that vertex. So two claws, you definitely can't draw uh, in a uh, uh, biplanar, biplanar fashion. And in fact, it's equivalent to being biplanar. Acyclic and no two claws. Cycles you can't do either, right? You go back and forth, now you have to close the cycle, you gotta cross everything you just drawn. So you can't draw cycles. So if there's a, a vertex that has at least three non-leaf neighbors, then that vertex is going to be part of a two claw or it's going to be part of a three cycle or a four cycle. And the reason this simple observation is going to be useful to us is that all these situations are bad. If I have a two claw, I've got to get rid of one of the edges in it, at least. I have to get rid of two claws to get a biplanar graph. If I have a three cycle or a four cycle, I have to get rid of at least one of the edges of those two cycles. I have to do those things. So in other words, once I make this observation, Whenever I find a vertex that has three neighbors that are not leaves, then I have to do something to that vertex. I have to process that vertex. I have to. I have to. But notice that it doesn't take long to find these <coughs> vertices that have to be processed. I'm, I'm not looking for arbitrary cycles. If I, if I were going on and say, well, I have to get rid of cycles, so let's start enumerating all the cycles in my graph, that would be a slow process if the cycles could be arbitrarily long. It's not what we're going to do. We're going to look for vertices. We just look at the neighbors and say, okay, are they, are they, do we have three non-leaf vertices? And then we can test easily if, or if also the vertex happens to be on a three cycle. It doesn't take you long to check if a vertex lies on a three cycle or a four cycle. So it's not going to take us long to find uh, uh, candidate vertices, and uh, we know we have to deal with them anyway. Okay, so here's a two claw. Uh, in this situation, so here's a here's the three three vertices adjacent to the starting vertex that are not leaves. So maybe they form a two two claw. Or maybe these guys aren't leaves because they're adjacent to a common vertex, in which case we get a four cycle and we have something like that. Or maybe uh, maybe uh, we have something like this. We have three neighbors of this vertex and they're not leaves. Well, maybe this one's not a leaf because it's adjacent. So we generating cycles are two claws when we have that situation. Small cycles are two claws. So we have to get, well, we have a situation like this. We've got to get rid of at least one vertex in the bad situation. We have to. So that suggests a search tree approach. So here's a picture of a graph. That's a whole graph, because that's about all you can draw an example of on, the, on, the, on a slide. And now what we're going to pay attention to is this red subgraph. So notice in that red subgraph, we have a vertex with this one in the lower left corner. And it's adjacent to three neighbors uh, that are not leaves. So we have got to, and in fact, it's a two-claw. So we, we've got to deal with that two-claw. 
So how many possible ways could we get rid of that tooth claw? Well, I've got six edges in this case, and, and I have to get rid of one of them. So I could get rid of this edge, or this edge, or this edge, or one of those edges, and that red tooth claw has got to go, at least, maybe more, but for sure we have to get rid of one. So we're just going to try all these six possibilities and start a branching tree structure. So it's a bounded search tree, bounded search tree approach. So let's say uh, from this is a root, we have these six uh, possibilities at the next level. And now this uh, vertex is going to generate another problem, namely I've got this, I've got this triangle here. This vertex is on a triangle, so I've got to I've got to get rid of one of those one of those edges. So that generates three possibilities sitting underneath this this uh, edge. If I identify that that's the next thing I want to do. So I have this branching process again. And uh, at depth k, if we get depth k, then uh, we've removed k edges. Every time we go down a level, we've removed another edge. So it's a bounded search tree. The depth of that search tree can be at most k. Uh, and each search, each node in that tree has got at most six edges, because I'm getting something that looks like a, I've got the three neighbors that aren't leaves, and so they're going to generate at most six edges in their structure, maybe a two-claw, but maybe something a little simpler that involves a cycle. So at, if I succeed in getting down to level something less than k, still have some budget remaining, or even if I use up all the budget, then what's left is I, I no longer have any vertices that are adjacent to three or more non-leaves. So every vertex is adjacent to at most two other vertices that are not leaves. So those, what remains, could possibly form a collection of reeds. So cycles with, with leaves hanging off them, right? Because the vertices in the cycle, you'd have, they would have two non-leaf neighbors and then possibly some leaves attached. So when you get down to that situation, then you've got component reefs. What do you have to do with component reefs? Well, there's a big cycle there. You have to get rid of the cycle. So in each component reef, you have to hope you've got enough budget left to choose an edge in that component reef. And you don't care which one, because if you destroy the component reefs at that point, then you've destroyed uh, uh, all the cycles in your graph and all the two costs. So, therefore, you're going to get an algorithm that runs in the size of the graph times uh, six, 6 to the k. Why 6 to the k? Well, at each node, we had the six-way, at most six branches to pursue. The depth would be at most k. And the processing time at each node, uh, looking for the next uh, vertex to apply a rule to and uh, making the budget smaller and making the graph smaller, that can be done in linear time at size of graph. So the running time is going to be size of the graph times uh, 6 to the k. Now, in fact, uh, you can improve this. You can get uh, uh, a result that looks like that. And uh, Matt did quite a bit of experiments with this. I won't show you the experimental results. There are all kinds of it, there's a real need in, in fixed parameter tractability for actually experimenting, implementing the algorithms and experimenting with them to see how, how well they work. And there's actually very little, not, not much experimental work in the literature. One reason for that is probably that theoretical people get excited about the, getting the FBT algorithm and then the trouble in implementing it, maybe that's not so bad either, but then doing the experiments and doing a meaningful comparison of how well your algorithm works in comparison with someone else's is really a problem. 
So there's some standard databases like the Stanford graph base. So maybe you find a paper in the literature where somebody used that, so you can use the same same database. But they implemented their algorithm in a different language than you did, and they did it on a different platform than you did. All, all these kinds of things make it difficult to make a direct comparison and say, well, our algorithm's twice as good as the integer linear programming books. You can't. But we got some kind of qualitative uh, experimental results that show that uh, actually the, the two approaches, the integer linear programming approach and the fixed parameter tractable approach for this two-layer planarization problem are kind of complementary. The types of graphs for which the integer linear programming approach worked well were kind of, uh, I've forgotten whether it's sparse or dense graphs, and our approach worked well in the opposite case uh, situation, and we were both able to handle very roughly the same size of, of, of graphs. You have to say how many vertices, but also what's the edge density going to be, and, and so forth. So um, that's... Um, that's all uh, I'll, I'll say about FPT and uh, Rackdrum for now. So that's the end of my talk. Does somebody have a question before lunch? Any questions? I think there's lots of opportunities here for people who want to try implementing some algorithms and see how well the approach works, how big a graph can you do, how many vertices. Give yourself three minutes running time. <laughs> what, what, what kind of situations can you handle? Pull the plug after three minutes or pull the plug after 30 seconds because you're going to be doing lots of uh, trials over and over again. So just give yourself a time budget and see how far you can get with your time budget. Then you want to solve some things to optimality, so that's another problem. How do you get some ground truth to experimental problems? Any questions? Any questions? Okay, well thank you.